Our speaker tonight is uh, someone who we're very familiar with. Uh, basically, I grabbed her almost every year or two to give a talk, and she uh, kindly accepts. And uh, a local uh, paleontologist at the Museum Center, uh, trial bite expert, and uh, my boss down there, one of you down there. Uh, Brenda Hanke, and she's going to talk to us tonight about the role of transitional fossils in evolution. Thank you for having me out again. Um, I have to say it's been a little bit since I've been here because the fall season is usually so packed, so I'm really delighted to be back. Uh, I want to continue on with our Darwin Love Fest. This evening, I feel like uh, I almost don't need to lecture because we've had such great discussions already about Darwin. Uh, but I'm going to take us a little bit through some of the things that Darwin said in On the Origin of Species and really talk about the role of transitional fossils, what they mean um, for evolution. When I first wrote this talk, I intended it as a public talk. I gave it at Sunrock Farm as part of their evolutionary series for the public. Because I want to dispel some myths about one of the biggest criticisms that creationists have towards a theory of evolution, which of course is the lack of transitional fossils in the fossil record. And not much kind words to say about that, other than to say that that criticism, of course, illustrates a fundamental misunderstanding, fundamental misunderstanding of geology and biology pretty much in one fell swoop. And I wanted to dispel those myths and give, a peop give people a really good understanding of the basics of why it is transitional fossils um, become such a big deal when we talk about evolution. This tree of life that we have is not really meant to depict, is not meant to depict evolutionary relationships at all, much like scientists do. It's just meant to show diagrammatically sort of the one rich, wonderful biodiversity that we have on the planet, and to symbolize the fact that through evolution and extinction, we get a modern biota that we can study. But that modern biota, that modern flora and fauna that makes up our biodiversity today, certainly has a long history. And in order to understand relationships of our modern biota, we can look to things like molecular genetics, for instance, to give us an understanding at the molecular, molecular level of, of relationships but to really know what transitions look like physically, we need to go back into the fossil record to understand and to, to interpret those wonderful changes that we see as part of Earth's uh, life history. It's these transitional fossils that give us basically our roadmap uh, to our modern biota. So let's, let's start off with the definition of what a transitional fossil is. The fossilized remains of a life form that illustrates an evolutionary transition. Okay, great. Uh, what does that mean? Um, transitional fossils will show a mosaic of features. They will have features that are reminiscent of their um, ancestry and also features that are on the way to, um, to their descendants. They're going to be a mix of ancestral and descendant features. The paleontologists, when they study fossils, tend to look for transitional features rather than for transitional fossils. So we're more interested in the morphology, um, and those features than we are than actually calling something um, a, a transitional fossil in and of itself. Now, of course, Darwin, who wrote On the Origin of Species, um, published as we already know in 1859, came up with hypothesis of what the transitions should look like and how speciation should occur. Basically, it's a gradual pattern where you see, you see a small, uh, a series of small, gradual, continuous changes in morphology through time that basically build up through time to give us sort of our modern biota. Now when he first came up, of course, with um, this theory, uh, there had been no transitional fossils found in the fossil record yet. And one of his predictions was that if indeed speciation and evolution did proceed this way, that we should expect to see tons of intermediate forms. But because we have, they hadn't found any yet, this was of great concern to him. How am I going to convince people that indeed things are related through descent? Well, there was a huge chapters in his book 
on the nature of the geologic record. He did some discussions on geographic distribution of, of fossils and organisms, which we're going to look a little bit more detail about. But two years after the publication of The Origin of Species, one of the biggest and what best known transitional fossils today was first found, Archaeopteryx. And Archaeopteryx was considered to be pretty much a stunning victory for Darwin in terms of uh, showing common descent. Later on in the 1870s, Marsh also published a lot of work on, on horse evolution, showing evolution within a single lineage at the time, as well as more work on um, developmental biology and other areas like biogeography he began to strengthen, of course, Darwin's ideas um, about evolution. But Darwin at length in his book on why it would be that we would not be seeing transitional forms. And he discussed in length about the imperfections in the geologic record. Okay? And we don't have to read all of this, but a small section would be only a small portion of the globe has been geologically explored with care, that only certain organic beings have been largely preserved in a fossil state, okay? and that we certainly don't have a continuous geologic record at any one point on the Earth. And so just the way that rocks are laid down, the way the stratigraphic record is created, in and of itself is going to have gaps. And that this means that we are not going to find all those intermediate fossils that he has uh, predicted will occur. So we know, of course, now that he was right. The fossil record, the stratigraphic record, is imperfect. We have uh, processes of deposition as well as erosion or non-deposition that gives us temporal or unconformable gaps in the stratigraphic record where we're missing time. Okay? We also have destruction of ocean floor um, on the Earth uh, regularly through plate tectonics. So we destroy crust and we destroy sediments regularly. So it's in these ways that we are going to be creating these gaps. And of course in many other ways. And of course we have a huge stratigraphic gap here in the local area, right? We have Ordovician basement rock, or Ordovician bedrock, excuse me, overlain by Pleistocene glacial rock, with a gap of about 200 or 400 million years or so, maybe a little bit more. And if we had just taken that as our example, our sort of microcosm of what the stratigraphic sort of record would look like, we'd be missing dinosaurs absolutely completely and would never have been able to interpret or to be able to see um, the evolution of birds from um, avian theropods. Another um, reason why transitional fossils may be so difficult to come across is the idea of unexplored lands. Okay? Most of North America and Europe have been explored traditionally very heavily for fossils, but there are large ones of the Earth that have not been touched. Uh, this is from the Paleobiology database, uh, showing the major groups um, of sampling for major groups of organisms. And you can see that in certain groups, some have better coverage than others. Uh, of course, mammals, um, excuse me, things like places like Africa, parts of China, South America, for instance, a lot of those regions have yet to be explored. And it's also important to keep in mind that documenting transitions in the fossil record takes some paleontologists their entire careers to do. That there's not an abundance of us out there scouring the globe at every second. And sometimes they're just difficult to find because of preservation. So I'm setting this, what I'm doing is I'm trying to set the stages for the reasons why it would be difficult to find a transitional form. And then we're actually going to turn it all the way around backwards on itself. Very few organisms that have ever lived on the history of life on Earth actually make it in the fossil record. It's hard to become a fossil, okay? We preserve usually hard parts. And while we are spoiled here in Cincinnati, we know that there's fossils that abound in our rocks, in our local strata. It's actually very difficult to become fossilized. Preservation is destructive for the most part. And so not only do you have to be um, 
deposit, uh, uh, buried and um, preserved in those layers through a variety of uh, techniques. You have to be uplifted, you have to be exposed, and you have to have somebody there looking. 